And uh, tonight we are honored to have uh, Professor Milagros Deni. I will say a few words that are already in the program, but and also we have a guest speaker, uh, a Professor Anthony P. Brown. Uh, let me first say that Milagros Deni is assistant professor in the Department of Africana and Puerto Rica Latino Studies at Hunter College. Uh, until 2007, she was instructor at the Department of Latino and Hispanic Caribbean Studies at Rutgers University. She earned a PhD in Latin American and Caribbean history from Howard University, an MA in Africana Studies from Cornell University, and a BA in Art History from the University of Puerto Rico. Professor Dennis is currently working on her manuscript entitled One Drop of Blood, Racial Formation and Meanings in Puerto Rican Society, 1898-1960s, which is a historical analysis of race in Puerto Rican society. Good evening. Uh, I want to, to thank the Center for Puerto Rican Studies for making this exhibition possible to Edwin Menendez, uh, the director, Alberto Hernandez, uh, especially to Pedro Juan and, and the staff of uh, the archive and the library. Uh, I also want to thank my colleagues from the Department of African and Puerto Rican Latino Studies for their intellectual and moral support. And finally, and not least, I want to uh, thank friends and members of the community for being here. <clears throat> the exhibition asserting the rights of Puerto Ricans and African Americans in their quest for social justice is the result of a research, research project that begun and hasn't finished because I'm still working on it this past summer. It was intended to address the following. What kind of interactions existed between Puerto Ricans and African Americans between, uh, beside the rich um, uh, research on the young lords and music? And what kind of literature exists on that that I can really uh, start uh, looking and accommodate my, my, my agenda in terms of uh, research and how my research is going to contribute to that uh, scholarship? The process began identifying a specific collections of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. There I found uh, so much information and material that shed light on this interaction from earlier pe period than the 1960s. I also confronted challenges as a historian in balancing the material of, of Puerto Rican sources and African Americans. And I, and I did it in some way that I include as primary sources African American newspapers, such as the New York Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, Variety, and others. I was also able to read a transcript of the Bronze African American Oral History Project housing in Fordham University because there I find also uh, African Americans talking about their interactions with Puerto Ricans. <clears throat> so I realized that instead of having a literary research project, I ended with enough data material to write a substantial article and a book. Uh, I want to explain myself because as a historian, we like to, to justify whatever we do. Uh, the title, Asserting the Right. I refer here to the action of a group of people that know clearly who they are in this society and in some way the system is excluding them and not allowing to exercise their rights, their rights as American citizens and part of this society. In this context, I frame the exhibition to begin in the 1980s. Um, I, I use the 1980s because it's this in, in this particular uh, period when the United States is consolidating as a world power and the ideology of the manifest destiny is the driving force behind all American policies that is going to be applied in the Caribbean, Latin American, and other parts of the world. Um, an important uh, date in the 1890s, in 1896, in the case, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, that the Supreme Court institutionalized segregation. And for, for Puerto Ricans, uh, Two years later, in 1988, the United States in, in engaged in the Spanish-American War and take the island of Puerto Rico as a possession. And Puerto Ricans are going to become an imperial subject. And that is a metaphor that I'm using here. <clears throat> Another justification, why to focus on New York? Well, 
First is because I'm, I think that there is a lot of historiography uh, scholarship based uh, on the experience of Puerto Ricans uh, in New York. And I also uh, um, refer to the study of Andy Torres in his in book, uh, Beyond the Mel Melting Spot, where he argues that outside of New York City, Latinos and African Americans have not been exposed to this collective history. What collective history is living in a urban center where they equally are oppressed and excluded? In this sense, I think also that Puerto Rican and African Americans share the same space and compete for the same resources of the city. It seems that New York is again a source of an anthropological laboratory to study race relations, urban conflict politics, and so on. Another important aspect that I uh, take into consideration when I decided to select uh, the documents here is how, how can we start looking history from uh, the point of view of people that maybe people have already uh, studied and others that they have been overlooked. And I uh, decided to uh, frame uh, the exhibition using history, and I just, you some of already took the look of how I uh, lay out, uh, starting with the 1890s, and then I move on to the 1930s, 1940s, 50s, because these are important dates in the history of the United States. Uh, and I start uh, to, uh, trying to um, talk about the imperial subject, and this is the first layout here where we have uh, um, the United States after it took over the island, uh, and the island became a possession, uh, they changed many aspects of Puerto Rican society. And key to these changes was the total makeover of the educational system. The government arranged to send Puerto Ricans of African descent, the majority of them, to racially segregated schools in Alabama, Pennsylvania, and Virginia in order to receive what it was conceived vocational training. And it was not surprising, but it was a surprise to see that many Puerto Ricans ended in uh, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And Booker to Washington, uh, he was enthusiastic about that idea, and he uh, 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 thought, and, uh, and I'm going to quote, he embraced the idea of, quote, bringing a number of promising Negro young men and women to Tuskegee from Cuba and Puerto Rico. So that was his, his idea of uh, helping uh, Cubans and Puerto Ricans. As the principal of Tuskegee Institute, Washington accepted the offer of the Department of Education of Puerto Rico to cover boarding and other related expenses for fellow Puerto Ricans, students that were accepted at, in Tuskegee. So they started uh, arriving to Tuskegee in the 1899, and we, according to the records of Booker T. Washington that I have the opportunity to uh, study when I was at uh, Washington, D.C., uh, they uh, ended in 1915. So there is a lot of information about this Puerto Rican stu student that uh, we don't know that much the story. I, uh, I can uh, really, uh, that will be another uh, part of the project. Um, in the second uh, period that I study is social demands and reforms, and I focus in the 1940s and 50s. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I jumped number. This is so important. 18, 1899. Uh, in the 1890s, I'm sorry about this, um, the uh, situation in Puerto Rico under the Spanish colonial system was very, very difficult, and many Puerto Ricans decided to exile uh, here in New York, and they established their communities, and they, they have been documented through different anecdotal literature, but we have a very important uh, example of that, and this is Arturo Schomburg, who arrived in the 1890s, and he established in uh, Harlem and in Brooklyn, and we know that he uh, married twice, and his wife were African-American women, and from one way or the other, according to the, the, the work of uh, Jesse Huffnoff, he, uh, he, like, he was immersed 
in what we call African-American identity. And Schomburg uh, was embraced by uh, the African-American community and is considered, considered one of the intellectual pillars of the black community. And in this first uh, um, banner here, we have a photograph of Schomburg when he was young, and there's an, another photograph there where it's showing him with Marcus Garvey. So he was very active. I found a very important photo that I couldn't include and give it to uh, Pedro Juan of Schomburg in Howard University with uh, Du Bois and all the big guys uh, sharing time when they were preparing the Encyclopedia of the Negro. So that was an interesting way to see how uh, Puerto Ricans, in the very beginning of the settlements here in New York, they were interacting with African Americans. Uh, 1940s, I focus on a situation when the, we have the Puerto Rican community already established here in New York, and I give prominence to the uh, Pura Bel Press. Pura Bel Press. Uh, she was a librarian, and she arrived to um, New York in the 1920s, and she was hired in the 135th a branch that's uh, up in Harlem, and from there she started uh, to uh, provide uh, assistance to the people on Harlem, but a particular children where she was uh, uh, writing uh, stories and performing uh, puppet shows. So we have in the second banner, the third one here, some uh, items of Pura Bel Pre, uh, with reading to children, and an important element of that f uh, connection with African Americans is that she married an African American musician, composer, Cl Clarence, Cameron uh, White. So he was very important. Uh, his papers are part here in the center and the Chamber Center. But the uh, uh, documents that I found of Berpre show not only her work as a librarian and a writer, but she was very active in different uh, organizations. And I found one very interesting that it was a, a name. A, Association for the Advancement of Puerto Rican People, and this was 1939, and it showed that they were inspired by the National Association of Advancement of Colored People. So we have a, a community of Puerto Ricans, and in some way or the other, they are trying to uh, 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 make their rights in the city, and they are modeling from uh, African Americans' organization. Another important uh, finding was uh, that she was part of another institution in the 1940s of a workshop of cultural, for cultural democracy. And it was a, a, a group, a organization that advocated for interracial approach to education. And she's listed as a, a, a part of the board along with W.B. Du Bois and Dr. Leonard Covello. So uh, she was very active throughout her life and that is demonstrated for all her publications and all her uh, documents that are found in her collection. So I took her as a good example of what I call a pioneer, a cultural, cultural pioneer, because she used her skills and position to advance the educational rights of blacks and Puerto Ricans. Uh, I move on to the 1940s, and the 1940s is the period of the World War II, when we have the uh, uh, participation of Puerto Ricans and African Americans in the World War, the second, but at the same time, we have a, a Puerto Rican communities establishing more so, uh, concrete in, in New York, and African Americans are aware of that. And I found interesting newspapers from the uh, New, uh, New York uh, Amsterdam News, uh, the Chicago Defender, and Variety, among others, that they are documenting the presence of Puerto Ricans in Harlem. And uh, there is an editorial note from, uh, I believe, from uh, New York, uh, Amsterdam News, that they, they're saying that they're going to start a series of uh, publications dealing with Puerto Ricans. So it's in some way to, to acknowledge their presence, and I believe that it went through all the 1940s and 1970s, and uh, this is when, uh, when they begin to really establish their connection and when they uh, establish an alliances again the uh, poverty. So I move on there to the 1960s, and then I, I use the collection of Jesus Colón that is very well known in the community. Uh, he arrived in New York early in the beginning of the 20th century. He was 
uh, activist, socialist, communist labor leader, uh, and he uh, also uh, established in his own way connections with the African-American community. And from his collection, I was able to identify documents uh, where he, um, well, he participated in the um, elections of 1969. Mayoral, um, mayoral elections with a Rashid story. So uh, here we have display uh, the uh, what it was used to um, make the what we call politic act of uh, Jesus Colon and, and Rashid. And uh, Jesus Colon was running for controller and Rashid was running for mayor. This was 1969. So uh, this is a, a good example precisely on other ways that uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans uh, established their uh, uh, relations. And um, there is in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, and other groups that they were established. And some way or the other, I established like a parallel in terms of community organization. These are grassroots groups. And I have uh, for this play uh, the United Bronx Parents Association and Evelyn Antonetti. Uh, that established this uh, organization in 1965, and they have a very similar platform from Cody, the Congress for, for or, uh, Racial Equality in Brooklyn, and uh, Evelyn Antonetti and her group, they were very active, and they were pioneering creating a lunch summer program in 1971 where they were sending lunch to all kids at school in, uh, in New York, including um, Queens, uh, Brooklyn and in, her, in the collection of UBP, I found letters recognizing her uh, work and effort. So uh, it was a very active uh, period for uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans in that uh, regarding the war on poverty, and that is maybe one of the, uh, I think the bulk of the collection is probably 60s, 70s, uh, and the display that we have today. And then, oh, there are other activities that pertain connecting the communities. Maybe some of them are cultural, some of them are mostly uh, uh, create, informing the community for issues that are affecting the community, like uh, the war on Vietnam. We have uh, a display where we have uh, Mohammed Ali uh, uh, protesting against the war, and then they have a Puerto Rican soldier. So this is a very interesting topic to develop, and I just, again, uh, trying to uh, give you an a, a example of what we can do with that topic. And, um, and that continued to the 1980s. Um, um, still, I, I, we're using the UBP collection. It's very big. And, and there was a very good activity that took place here in the center. It was here the activity of Jesus Colom, uh, Pedro Juan. Okay, so... It, in 1983, the Centro uh, launched uh, uh, the Oral History Project, and that day was invited, uh, was dedicated to Jesus Colón, one of the pioneers. And they, as part of the program, they invited Ossie da uh, Davis and Miriam Colón. And we have also photographs of the uh, presentation of Ossie Davis that consisted of reading, dramatic readings of uh, Jesus Colón. Uh, literature. So it was a very interesting way, and I also went beyond that connection, and O.C. Davis, uh, as you know, he passed away uh, recently, well, recently, this was in 2005, and he was the founder of the uh, Third, Third World Reel, and it was intended to provide training in film, in the film industry to African Americans and Puerto Ricans. And there were several projects that they were engaged in the community. Um, and then in the 1980s, as the new government came into place, and we have a, a new a conservative go a government, Puerto Ricans uh, feel that they are Puerto Ricans and African Americans. All their uh, gains that they have, they were threatened. So a third generation uh, that were part, very active in the 1960s, that probably they were young lords, as Richie Perez, they uh, take the lead in the civil rights struggle. In this period, now I'm talking 1980s and 90s, issues of police brutality trigger another movement among Puerto Ricans and African Americans. This chief is clearly represented by the activism and milita militancy of Richie Perez. This is another collection that will be the last 
one of the last banners that as an ex-member of the Young Lords, Perez used his pedagogical background uh, and photographical skills to document the new challenge that the community was confronting. So he was also an activist, a photograph, and he used the camera as an instrument to denounce police brutality. And the camera here plays a very important role because before in the 1970s they were denouncing how the media, etc., were portraying minorities and he's going to use the same instrument to reverse what they were trying to uh, put on, on, on the society. So the series of photographs depicted in the exhibition illustrate that the struggle continued and new approaches have emerged to document the com this complexity. Um, in the same period, uh, we highlight here the role of Antonia Pantoja and Aspira in terms of community activism, self-empowerment, and uh, trying to find ways to educate and uh, provide uh, um, education to children in, within the community. One of the important uh, um, legacies of Pantoja is uh, uh, that they uh, along with other organizations, they push for uh, bilingual education here in the landmark case, uh, Spira versus Board of Education. So that was in 1972, but uh, was implemented officially in 1974, and it became part of the educational system of New York. Um, Puerto Ricans and African Americans understand that the fight to fight discrimination and achieve social justice cross-racial coalitions are the best strategy. Today, the struggle continues as more challenges confront black and Puerto Rican Latino communities. An important milestone was achieved when during the 2008 elections, Barack Obama was elected as the first African-American president of the United States. Following this victory, Puerto Ricans witnessed the confirmation of Sonia Sotomayor as a Supreme Justice. As their quest, in the quest for social justice, Puerto Rican and African Americans realize that they are not alone. They also recognize that the city of New York is a battlefield where, they, as a group, they must compete for its resources. Both communities are reminded every day that American citizenship was not given to them, but every day they must to prove that they deserve it. Thank you. Our guest speaker, Anthony P. Brown, PhD, is an associate professor in the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies at Hunter CUNY. He received a BA from Cornell University, an MA from UCLA, and PhD in sociology from Columbia University. His teaching, research, and the scholarship focus, focuses on issues related to black diasporic communities with a focus on community organizations, social movement, racial inequality, Africana sociology, and popular culture, particularly hip hop. He's the recipient of several grants and awards for, this, for his research, including the George M. Schuster Faculty Fellowship. With that, I welcome uh, first uh, Professor Milagros Dennis and then Professor Anthony Brown. Hi, good evening all. Um, first of all, I think I want to change my title uh, to uh, summarizer as opposed to guest speaker. Uh, this is such a wonderful exhibit, so I want us to have the opportunity to you know, fully experience uh, the work that uh, Professor Dennis has, has really put into this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I would uh, say uh, just a few remarks. One is that Professor Dennis's work uh, extends and advances an important and burgeoning area of scholarship which centers on the intersection of social, economic, and political relations among Puerto Ricans and African Americans in an often unforgiven uh, capitalist society that we call America. Uh, moreover, for Puerto Ricans, having to confront not only America's rig rigid racial binary, uh, the black-white binary, but also a form of second-class U.S. citizenship uh, resulted in long-standing uh, examples of cooperation and struggle with African Americans against racism and inequality. Uh, Professor Dennis's work helps fill uh, an enormous gap in our scholarship by assisting us in understanding and interpreting this history and learning some very important lessons 
uh, from it. Uh, certainly, undoubtedly, the racialization of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. Uh, by the dominant group forced them uh, to occupy a similar, what we call, structural position in America's stratification system. As such, uh, issues of employment, educational opportunities, uh, discrimination, policing, access to political power, social services, and preserving cultural leg uh, legacies and linkages were well, all concerns that were germane, I would argue, to both groups, and therein lie uh, the similarity. Uh, if we look politically, we can see uh, over this period of time uh, the kinds of political coalitions that were developed amongst these groups. Culturally, uh, we see quite a bit of synergy uh, between these groups. Uh, similarly, when we look socially in terms of education, housing, uh, we see, again, similar struggles uh, that are waged by these groups. So this work helps us uh, to place these efforts uh, certainly within a larger and a more expansive historical time frame. Now, certainly there are some contemporary scholars that focus more on conflict. Uh, and you don't need to take Sociology 101 to know that conflict is something that is endemic to all groups. Uh, the question is, uh, how do groups, uh, how well do groups successfully manage conflict so it doesn't undermine the larger agenda of the group? And I think Professor Dennis's work here highlights uh, how these groups have been able to successfully, uh, despite certain differences that existed, uh, forge an important coalition uh, on several areas uh, during uh, this period. Uh, certainly, uh, as an academic, uh, it's important uh, to bring up how this racialization uh, of Puerto Ricans also was evidence in academic scholarship. Uh, certainly, as, as yeah, I'm talking here to many folks who are academics, we all know that uh, scholarship, particularly that which focuses on quote-unquote marginalized groups, has often been infested with the ideology of the dominant group. And certainly when we talk about Puerto Ricans, they were not immune to this. Uh, there is a plethora of scholarship, uh, certainly per perhaps most not notably uh, the work of uh, Glazer and, and Moynihan, that pointed to supposed, if you will, cultural and social deficits uh, within Puerto Ricans and African Americans that, as they claim, were responsible for their marginalized economic status. Certainly in opposition to this, uh, many notable uh, uh, Puerto Rican leaders and African American leaders uh, who are certainly featured here in this exhibit made the unambiguous case that structural issues including low wages, inferior education, substandard housing, punitive social services, uh, and others were really the underlying reasons uh, why this inequality persisted uh, over uh, this long uh, period of time. Uh, I think uh, a couple of other issues I think also needs to be raised here. Uh, Professor Dennis's work certainly uh, argues for a more nuanced and comprehensive approach uh, to the study of how Puerto Ricans asserted their rights. Uh, her work documents a compelling narrative of how Puerto Ricans in the face of severe marginalization were able to assert their rights and fight for, quite successfully, uh, establishing viable communities here in the U.S., again, despite enormous obstacles uh, to this process. And as they did this, uh, African Americans uh, also claimed a similar struggle. Uh, as Professor Dennis's uh, work highlights, certainly the great migration that African American experienced, uh, particularly after World War II, as migrants having to find their way in cities like New York and others, experienced uh, similar forms of severe racial inequality. And I think therein lies many of the commonalities uh, that this work speaks to. Uh, the other piece here I think uh, is also worth mentioning is that the work of Professor Dennis and our colleague uh, Professor Juan Flores I think has been uh, critically important in advancing the scholarship uh, uh, that looks at the interconnection and nexus of these two groups. And we would be certainly remiss without talking about the role of black and Puerto Rican students in 1968-1969 that literally took over Hunter College and forced a very reluctant administration to create what was then called the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies. So what I'm saying here is that both inside uh, of the academy and outside of the academy, we see many, many salient examples of how these groups work together 
to build uh, long-lasting institutions that have certainly transformed New York City and helped to transform certainly the liberal arts as a discipline right, uh, by new methodologies, new theories, and new perspectives. And I think this work uh, certainly helps us uh, to highlight uh, this. So in sum, and again, I, I do want to uh, make sure that everyone gets a chance to um, uh, fully experience the exhibit. In some, I would contend that this exhibit sheds light on the experiences and the interrelations of these groups right, and forces us, I think, to rethink uh, many of our assumptions about uh, the relationships between these groups right, and the successes and certainly the remaining challenges uh, that they both face, certainly in when we talk about today's society, in a neoliberal global society. And so issues, uh, there are certainly underlying issues that are persistent, but I think that uh, within this contemporary moment, uh, we also face uh, extreme uh, uh, challenges moving forward in the, in the struggle for social justice. So I thank Professor Dennis for her work uh, and for bringing us together uh, this evening. Thank you.